hand. <laughs> My name is Judy Valentine, and I'm an employee of Canterbury Pharmacy. I also have a PhD in nutrition, and they asked me to do a talk on supplements, which I've done many times in the past. It's one of my favorite topics. And I, what I'm going to do is introduce myself in terms of my background, very brief. And then I'm going to pass these around. We can start doing that now. And basically talk about why we need to supplement. Give you my reasons why I think we need to supplement. And then I'm going to tell you about some supplements that Cannabis Pharmacy has formulated. And I'll go over that, and we've got a display of those products in the back. And what I like to do when I give a talk is answer questions as they come up. So, you know, it is a large group, but it would be kind of fun to have a little interaction so then it hopefully might not be as boring for you. I'm not a boring speaker, actually. I find it interesting, though, that um, I am a nutritionist, and we've got kind of both ends covered. We've got it coming in, and we've got it going out. So. <laughs> 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 That's got a good sense of humor. Yeah. 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 So I am a Mainer. That's why I have a good sense of humor. Yeah. I went away for a while and learned some things, and then came back. And my husband and I were in Washington, D.C. for 20 years. And uh, we've been back for about five years. We live over on the mid-coast. And I have a private uh, clinical practice, nutrition practice, and I also work for the pharmacy a couple days a week in the Rockport branch. So uh, actually give me one of the ones <laughs> can follow what I'm talking about. So I, I actually developed this sheet a long time ago because clients would come to me and say, if I eat a really, really, really good diet, organic, vegetables and fruits, this and that, do I still need to supplement? And I said, that's a very good question. I'm going to look at both sides of the, the story and come to my own conclusions. And so that's what I've done on this sheet. So basically, one of the first reasons that I think supplementing is important is the foods. Now, you guys have been around for a long time, too. Yeah. Haven't you noticed how food has changed since the 1950s? Yeah. I mean, I remember my mom, you know, putting the frozen dinner and the frozen dinner commercials on TV. The woman with her apron and her dress, and she's making dinner, and which actually <laughs> consisted of putting a frozen dinner in the freezer. That was very different. That was like a post-World War II phenomenon. Before that, people gardened, or they bought from their local farmers, and that food, that, that, those plants were much more nutritious than they are today. So what's happened is that farming has changed also. Instead of having a lot of local farms in our area, although we're lucky in Maine that we do have, how many people buy from farmers markets or their local farms? Isn't it wonderful? So we don't always have to go to Hannaford or, or Shaw's to get our vegetables, which have probably come from great long distances in a lot of cases. So in the olden days, I'm going to call them the olden days, we used to put manure on, on the farm, on, on the gardens, right? And I mean, how many of us have smelled driving up to Sydney that, that those chicken <laughs> farms? <laughs> But it's good stuff. Now they use synthetic chemicals to, um, you know, grow a lot of food. So what we're finding is that these synthetic um, additives are changing the, the chemical composition of the plants. And the nutrient basis isn't the same that it used to be. So the other thing is, remember how good farms used to rotate crops? Mm -hmm. Why did they rotate the crops? Does anyone know? Bugs. Pardon? Bugs. No, one thing bugs. 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 Soil. Right. Soil. Right. To rebuild the soil, not to exactly. drain the soil. Exactly. <laughs> so certain plants draw up certain chemical compounds. Like some might draw up a lot of magnesium. Others might draw up a lot of other trace minerals. So rotating the crops kind of gives, you know, a, a, a balance of those nutrients in the soil. And, and so now that doesn't happen as much. So plants are very, very different chemically than they used to be. So if you, you can research this on Google. How many people use Google? Isn't that wonderful? Don't have to run to the library every time you have a question. But if you take an orange back in the 1950s and, and a chemical assay of that orange, it's about four times higher in vitamin C than oranges today. So that's just one example. So, so nutrient-wise, the food is very, very different. Also, historically, people would buy kind of as 
we, you know, as you go. So when something was fresh and it was harvested, we would go and buy it. Right now we have strawberries. So, you know, it's wonderful. We can go and buy strawberries locally. But now we're eating strawberries from where? California. 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 Blueberries from Chile. You know, so food is coming from all over the world. And what happens is when it's picked, and you all know this, it is its highest nutrient content that it ever will be right off the branch. When it sits in an, on an airplane or, or in the truck, back of the truck, it begins losing nutrients. Then it sits on the shelf of a grocery store for whoever knows how many days, continuing to lose nutrients. And then we cook. And what does cooking do to our food? It right. kills off some nutrients. So by the way, eating raw food, I highly recommend a simple thing, a simple change that, that everyone can make is to eat something raw with every meal. So it could be a raw tomato, it could be some fruit, it could be a salad, um, cucumber cut up. Something raw with every meal is going to give you the highest nutrition, assuming it's a high nutrient plant to begin with, right? Okay. Um, that basically covers basically what, what I've talked about, you know, in the first, on the first several lines of this paper. Also, um, people eat in fast food restaurants. Does anybody remember when McDonald's first came into Maine? Yeah. I happen to know that because my dad was the commercial real estate broker that brought the first McDonald's into Maine. I was a teenager then, and um, if I had known what I know now about <laughs> McDonald's, I would have tried to talk him out of it, but how did I know? No, I mean, there's a time and place for everything, but a lot of people live on fast foods. And fast foods not only have very, very low nutrient value, they also have what? Chemicals. Chemicals, additives, preservatives. And when I was in graduate school, I cried all the way through graduate school because what we've done to our food in this country is really heartbreaking. And, and I remember, you know, back in the 70s when I first became interested in nutrition, that there didn't seem to be a lot of kids with asthma and, you know, allergies. And it seems to me in just doing this for the, as, as long as I've been doing it that each subsequent generation of kids are becoming more and more ill. Have you yes. noticed that? Yes. 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 Why do you think that is? All those chemicals. Yes. chemicals. Yes. Right. So the food isn't as nutritious as it used to be, and there are a lot of chemicals that the, our body has to figure out what to do with. Okay. It's also, living in the world that we live in today, environmental exposures are very different. I don't remember the number, but the number of chemical compounds that have been approved for use in, in the U.S., is staggering. It's, it's in the hundreds of thousands that have been proved since the 1950s. So it's all around us now. There's really, I don't, you know, want to make everybody depressed tonight, but it's kind of everywhere. So the more we can nutrify our bodies and the tissue and the blood in our body, the more we can kind of tolerate, our bodies can tolerate those exposures. <coughs> Stress is also higher. I mean, I, that's my hypothesis, is that stress is higher today than it ever has been. But I've thought about that a lot over the years, and I'm thinking, you know, World War II was pretty stressful. And the people, you know, the families that had to deal with it, and the husbands going off. And so there, there have been other stressful times in our culture. Would you guys agree with me that, that it's more stressful today than oh, it ever yeah, has yeah, been? Yeah. In, okay. Yeah. So, there you go. The reason I bring up stress is because the fight or flight response to stress, I won't go into a lot of biochemical details, but when we get, when we are stressed, the body goes into this fight or flight mode, and a lot of nutrients are used by the body to respond to stress. Stress depletes all nutrients in the body. So, today we, people seem to be under what I call relentless stress. It's kind of like that day in and day out, not a lot of breaks from this stress. It really taps the adrenal glands, the adrenal glands swell up to go into fight or flight and respond to stress, and, and that's burning nutrients all the time in our system. So now I'm going to talk about the American diet. I call it the white man diet. I hope nobody's offended, <laughs> but I, I, I mean that, you know, tongue in cheek in a way. Um, it's interesting that other cultures have retained more of their traditional foods over the years in a better way than we have. And I know that in Europe, Europe refuses a lot of our food. They don't really want a lot of our food exports because we put so many chemical compounds in our food. So I know that says something to me. Okay, white refined sugar. 
white refined sugar is a highly processed sugar. Um, it it is they just keep see we went on this no fat kick in about the 70s because everybody thought that people were getting fat from fat. And so they took the fat out of a lot of the foods, right? So the, we see no fat, low fat in, in our supermarkets. And what they did was, what did they do? What did they add into it? To sugar. 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 So now all of the food, so much of the food on the shelves, if you look, it would be fun to do actually an, a, an ingredient, a, um, what is that on the side of a food package? I can't think of the word Nutrients, right now. Uh, the, uh, ingredients? Ingredient ingredients, label. Yeah. Teach people how to read ingredients. But if you look at the carbohydrate line on the label, that gives you a clue as to what the sugar content is. Because the carb, the line that says carbohydrate means the natural carbohydrate, like if it's flour or rice. Um, that's the, the plant itself, the, the amount of sugar that the plant itself contains. Listed just underneath it, indented, is the word sugar. That gives, tells you what is the added sugar, what they've added that is not, does not come natural inside the plant. And I like to try to, to keep that at 10 grams per serving or less. So with that in mind, keep that in your mind and when you go home, look in your cabinets and look at soda bottles or this or that and see what is the sugar level of that food that you're consuming. Because that's just added sugar above and beyond what's already grown Right. In. Typically how they do the, do the label, label if they're doing it properly. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Oh. So if you keep it at 10 grams per serving or less, and you know how to read the serving part on the top, I think a lot of you are, uh, are from a special group? Yes. <laughs> tops. What are you, where are you from? Tops. And what is tops? It's take off pounds sensibly. Awesome. That's great. So thank you for coming, actually, and I hope I add to your knowledge base. So yes, yeah, so that, that sugar line tells you, you know, how much added sugar is in there. And it's, it, it'll blow your mind when you start looking at labels. It's 25, 35, 40 grams of carbs, and I mean of sugars, per, you know, serving. So that adds up. The other thing is that, and, and I oftentimes have a, a whiteboard that I like to draw on, but sugar... Um, the way it's metabolized in the system, think about this. When we eat a meal, we get energy into our bloodstream, glucose. And, and the, the blood sugar surges that glucose level. So now we have a lot of potential energy. Well, if we're not climbing a mountain or hiking or whatever, um, and we don't disperse that glucose out of the bloodstream, the body says, uh-uh, we don't need that much sugar in the bloodstream. It's too dangerous to be floating around through the whole body. It's actually, sugar is very dangerous to t body tissue. And how do we know that? We know that through our diabetic friends, right? So they have, they, they lose extremities and they have eye problems, and that's sugar just feeding that tissue, poisoning that tissue. So basically the body says, no, we can't have that high glucose level if we're not going to burn it off in a certain period of time. So what it does is it produces insulin, and insulin from the pancreas tells the body, get that glucose out of the bloodstream. It's too high. It's a messenger. And so now that excess glucose, because the, the body will try to keep the glucose within a certain range. If we've gone beyond that range, insulin is produced and telling the body, bring it back down in the range. Where does that excess glucose go, do you think? Glucose is sugar, so we're just... You know, now it's a medical term. We've named it a fancy name. It's glucose. But where does where does that go? Any ideas? Once the body takes it out of the bloodstream, where does it go once it leaves the bloodstream? Fat cells. Anywhere else? It can go to nervous energy. Like kids, you know, after a birthday party, they're just swinging <laughs> off the chandeliers. Yeah. So I'm hearing laughter. That you've noticed that. So that. That's how we get fat. And that can happen at every meal and every snack because the body will regulate that glucose every time we eat. So yes, gaining weight results from eating more calories than we burned in a 24-hour period, but it also happens after every meal and every snack if we haven't burned off that extra glucose because it gets stored in fat cells to be used as future energy. So don't we have a lot of future energy walking around this country today? <laughs> yeah. We could probably illuminate New York City or something. 
<laughs> that would be a good use of it. <laughs> okay. Any questions on that? Because that's really that's interesting. Is it true? Yeah, it's a it simple is. concept. If you once you gain the weight and you gain those fat cells and you lose the weight, those fat cells are still there, only they just shrunk saying feed me, they feed me. Shrink so they down. never go away. That's depressing. <laughs> well, you don't gain, when you get fat, you don't gain extra cells. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, no, oh, no. Okay. Those are just those same fat cells will just expand. Oh, okay. So, yeah, you can shrink them back down. So, what I just taught you is a very important concept about glycemic balancing. Have you guys heard that term, glycemic yes. balancing? Mm -hmm. And that's how we lose weight, is to glycemically balance every meal and every snack so that you manage that glucose level. And the way to do that, if you're going to eat a carbohydrate, okay, a bread or a you know rice or a potato, um, to balance it with protein and healthy fat, because the protein and the healthy fat, what that does is it slows down the surge from the small intestines, right? The food comes in down the food pipe into the stomach, then goes into the small intestines, and then from the small intestines gets absorbed into the bloodstream, okay? I, this is very simplified. It has to go through the liver and all the liver's hepatic activity. But essentially, um, what we want to do is slow that surge from the stomach and the small intestines into the bloodstream. Fat and protein will regulate. So let's say we have a bagel for breakfast. That's white flour is pretty much sugar. Does everybody know that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So we have a ba bagel and coffee for breakfast. And um, glucose level goes up because it's pure carbs, pure sugar, and um, it's glycemic. If we have a bagel, and maybe it's a whole grain bagel, or maybe we're having whole grain toast, and we have an egg with it, or we have some avocado with it, we have some kind of healthy protein, you know, or we have turkey, you know, sausages, or, or healthy bacon, healthy sausages, hopefully healthy choices. What happens is, now that glucose isn't released into the bloodstream all at once it's slowly released, like a timed release capsule, into the bloodstream. So what, what does that do to the blood glucose level? It level. regulates the glucose level. It's such a simple, you know, concept. I can't believe I didn't bring my books. I actually published a book on all of this. I'm a very terrible self-book promoter, but I, I explain that concept in my book. And if anybody wants to ask me about the book, I'd be happy to bring some copies over to the pharmacy and you guys can take a look at it. But what I've done is in the book, I show you how to combine your foods in a glycemic way, very simply. Um, and, you know, so that you do manage that glycemic control over a 24-hour period. And have you noticed that if you add a healthy fat to a meal, don't you feel more satiated? And then you don't have cravings later. It's like having a healthy breakfast. Having a healthy breakfast, well balanced with protein, healthy fat, and a good healthy carb. Don't you feel like you can go a lot longer? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's when we get to that point where our blood sugar has <clears throat> dropped, because the glycemic part that I didn't tell you is when that glucose surges and the body says, no, we got to take it out of the bloodstream, and then it drops, it drops low. It drops low, and it makes us either shaky or very, very hungry, or it triggers our cravings. And, and, and at that point, depending on how low the blood sugar has dropped, maybe we do need a fast-acting sugar at that point if we're at a point where you know, we're hypoglycemic or we're going to pass out or something like that. The idea is not to have a roller coaster ride of, of blood sugar management. It's to keep that balanced and regulated so we don't have the cravings, we don't have, you know, those those moments that we eat everything in the kitchen before <laughs> we even, before the brain kicks in and says, oh my god, what did I do? We don't want to get to that point. So white enriched wheat flour, the fiber and the nutrients have been removed. I mean, the, the, under the typical American diet is high in nutrient robbers. So what I like to talk about, both in white refined sugar and, and the wheat, white enriched wheat. So what does the wheat grain look like? I have to use my hands here. So you have the little wheat kernel. It's very small. It's kind of oval shaped. And the outside of it is the fiber. It's the bran, right? And then on the bottom, there's a little tiny section that is the germ the bran and the germ. Well, all of a sudden, in the 60s and 70s, we decided we probably should remove the bran 
and remove the germ. That's where the fiber is. Mother Nature made that wheat that way for a couple of different reasons. One is that fiber regulates the surge of sugar into the bloodstream. And the way it does that is that the fiber creates this viscosity. So when we eat, everything turns into this kind of puddingish, you know, tough, thick liquid called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. And that chyme will either surge into the bloodstream quickly, or if you have things like fat in that chyme, or protein in that chyme, or fiber in that chyme, that it's like physics. That's what slows down the release of the sugar into the bloodstream. So we thought we would be smart and take away the bran and the germ. The other important part about this is the bran and the germ is where the micronutrients, the nutrients are. The B vitamins that your body needs to metabolize that carb and the trace minerals that the body needs. Does anybody remember the Krebs cycle from school? No? Okay. That's what turns glucose into energy. So to turn glucose into energy, we need all these cofactors, the B vitamins, zinc, all the other manganese trace minerals. When, those, when we're deficient in those, we're not turning glucose into energy. We're like, oh, so tired all the time. Because now our chemistry set isn't working right. Does that make sense? Yes. So we've taken this fiber out of our grains. Brown rice is better than white rice. Whole grain is better than refined grain. And we're wondering why, you know, people are getting so sick because it's just the body is not used to operating on food like that. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And fiber is also important for what are, what are other reasons that you know perhaps why for fiber might be important? For hmm? the muscles? Not so much for the muscles, but... Regularity. Regularity. Bowels. Bowels. GI. I love talking about the GI tract. I hope I don't get too <laughs> bathroom talk, but um, this whole GI tract, and think about it, visualize it. It starts in the mouth, ends in the anus, and it's one long tube that goes through different shapes from one end of the body to the other. Well, the GI tract, it's not really part of the body. It's where all this foreign matter that we consume goes to be processed and refined to then go in the bloodstream and then go to the cells and the tissue. It really is a barrier from the rest of the body, right? Because all of that that we consume has to go through a lot of different changes before it's allowed into the bloodstream and allowed in the cells and the tissue of the body. We can't just take meat, flesh, and send it to the bloodstream. It has to be broken down and turned into amino acids. Amino acids are compounds that get used by the body. The body is mostly protein, mostly amino acids. So now picture this big long tube through the body that the stomach is a part of, the small intestines, the colon, and think about it in a, in a very different way. So a lot of stuff goes through that hallway, that passageway. Stuff that's not so great a lot of times. It stays stuck behind. <coughs> what fiber does is it acts as a little broom and brushes that GI tract clean. And so what have we done? We've taken the fiber, the bran, off a lot of our grain products. So I, it made so much sense to me when I was in school. It's like, oh, no wonder we have so many people with GI tract issues. Constipation, diarrhea, you know, it's just prevalent. So that's the, one of the very, very important reasons for eating whole grain foods, and they're high in, in nutrients. So then we can talk about other commercialized foods, sodas. Sodas, by the way, they're starting to learn um, really deplete bone structure. Yeah. So people who drink a lot of sodas have bone loss. They've, they've actually, ep epimediological studies have been done to indicate that people who have bone loss, you know, have high soda. And I, I had read someplace that the diet soda was even worse. Than yeah, it's just all the these bone. chemicals. So it, once again, it's more chemicals. Yeah. But yeah. So and it may, and you may you may get a test that shows that you do have bones bone density, but is does it look like Swiss cheese? Because mm -hmm. some people you know get the okay, and then they're breaking a lot of bones, but the bones that they have aren't dense enough. You know, they're they're weak. Okay, um, okay. So, 
am I giving you some reasons why we need to supplement? Does anybody have any thoughts or questions about that before I start to talk specifically about how to choose a healthy supplement and what to look for? We're not getting the good out of food like we used to and we need help. Exactly. And I take supplements and I feel good. Um, are the supplements at the natural food store better? Yes. For our so system? if we don't have any other comments or questions, that's exactly where I'm where I'm headed. Jen. I can't hear. All right. Good carb level. Yeah. Oh. When you're reading the label. Oh, on the label, the carbs. It depends. I mean, just to look at a carb. Um, and say, is this a good level? What, what In my book, what I've talked about and what I found over a 20-year clinical practice is that a good range for a diet is to do 40, 30, 30. 40% 40 of our diet from healthy carbs, 30% from protein, healthy protein, um, hopefully hormone-free, antibiotic-free, right. you know, yeah. additive-free cattle or, or meat, fish, whatever, and 30% healthy fat. Now we went through, great question, thank you for asking. We went through a period where since the 50s where margarine and these hydrogenated oils came on the marketplace. Do you guys remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I ate it, everybody ate it. Um, <coughs> margarine, it's better for you. And it actually, they learned, and so in the 70s, I learned that margarine wasn't better for you because I learned how they were changing the chemical structure of those molecules. They were literally turning these oils into plastic. Plastic. Uh, yes, I read that. Stale. Oh, so the body does not know what to do with plastic. It doesn't have the enzymes to break plastic down. <laughs> it, it, and so... You know, so we just, you know, are writing to the FDA and, and doing, you know, lots of people doing a, a lot of work on trying to get labels put on foods. Finally, not that long ago, um, the FDA agreed to put labels on foods, no trans fats, no hydrogenated oils. Now we're kind of going away from that, and healthy fats are coming back into the picture. <coughs> All of that information back in the 50s, and in the 60s and 70s was based on a study that was run called the Framingham Nurses Study. I don't know if does anybody remember that. It was a 40-year study. And it was a collusion between, I lived in Washington, D.C. for 20 years, I'll tell you. I went there as a, a naive Mainer and I came back as a wise Mainer. <laughs> because what happens is the food industry and, and Congress colluded one of the congressional committees, colluded to approve <coughs> margarine as a food. Margarine had to be approved as a food because it's not from nature. So they had to run tests and they had to decide and Congress had to vote on whether or not to allow margarine to be sold in the grocery stores. Hmm. And what they, so the food industry based their scientific information on Framingham. And what Framingham was looking at was fats as it relates to cardiovascular risk and death. And five years into the study, which was very premature for a study, they were trying to draw conclusions saying that if your cholesterol level was over 200 or 220, they hadn't decided at that point where they were going to set it, that your risk of heart attack increased. And they used numbers increased by a certain percent. It's in my book, I don't remember it precisely. Well, one of my teachers, one of my teachers was in grad school when that happened. She was right at the University of Maryland. And, she, and that's the cool thing, when you live in Washington, you can go to these hearings. She went to one of the hearings, and she got the handouts, and she did the statistical analysis on the handouts that the committee, the political committee was given, and she came out to a much different percent increase of, cardi of death from cardiovascular disease than they, and they did. had. So she brought it to her, the head of her department, she was in graduate school, and, and he, he said, let's have the whole class do the analysis. They did it. They came out the, with the same results as the student, who was my future teacher. And so they, this gentleman, who was the head of University of Maryland graduate school on, on lipid biochemistry, called the head of the political committee and said, this, this is wrong information that you're giving these politicians, because the politicians don't know how to evaluate this stuff. And he said, your funding if you release this Aww. information, your funding will we'll be cut off. Oh. Uh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 so that's basically how margarine got approved. Now, Framingham, has that study has since ended. And do you know what Framingham showed? 
that half the people who die of cardiovascular disease have high cholesterol and half the people have low cholesterol. It was inconclusive. Oh. So in the meantime, we're giving everybody statins, and we really don't need to, and that's hopefully that's changing right over time. Um, but question, question everything. Do your own research. Talk to people, people who know. Excuse me. You know, you're talking about foods, and everything is fat-free, fat-free. Well, people that just go crazy fat-free, can that cause heart problems? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm getting off on a tangent here on fats, but I think it's so important. Every cell, fats are important in the body for a lot of different reasons. The brain is mostly fat. The blood-brain barrier. How do you create barriers inside the body? Have you ever thought about that from a physics point of view? Oils and fats. Have you ever shaken up water and oil? Mm -hmm. They separate. You can't, it's hard to permeate oil unless it's been emulsified. So the body uses oils and fats to create barriers where it doesn't want things to go. And every cell of the human body has a lipid, lipid meaning fat, barrier so that not just anything can leak out of the cell and not just anything can go into the cell. It has to be managed and regulated. So we need fat. Also, and see what you think about this, cholesterol, that molecule, and it's not really a lipid molecule, it's part lipid, part sterile, it's a, it's a waxy consistency. The body uses it as a repair molecule. And I think it was in 2002, it was the molecule of the year. So think about this. If you have damage inside the body, the body, the liver that makes most of the cholesterol, is going to upregulate production of cholesterol to go in and fix, you know, repair that tissue. So that's one reason for higher cholesterol levels. Cholesterol, as a molecule, is the precursor for all of our sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, testosterone, and all of our fight or flight adrenal hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. So think about the implications of cutting, of lowering people's cholesterol levels has had on our society medically. We need, now we need hormone, yeah, hormone management right. balancing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we need stress. Now we need depression. You know, I mean, we just have turned to all of these needs mm -hmm. as so a we result of lower something. The so it, cholesterol is important in the diet, and that's starting to change again. I mean, eggs had a bad rap for a very long time. Yeah. Eggs are a wonderful food. They make an entire critter, and they have the nutrient base and the and the macro nutrients protein, fat, and, and some sugar, not a lot, to create an entire being. Do, I mean, do you call a chicken a being? Anyway, you yes, know what I mean. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a very good healthy food. And obviously grass-fed, you know, free range are going to be healthier than those lined up on top of each other and cooped up and, you know, in those horrible conditions. So, you got me on a tangent. Uh, the meaning of daily value, like uh, 400 units of vitamin D I see on a bottle. Uh, is that the minimum that I need or the maximum? Where does it fit in that scale? Yeah, and that changes. So the question is, what are the, what are the, where do the doses?